please give a warm welcome to Jeremy Thomas. Well, it's a great honor to have you here, Jeremy. When I, when I introduced the film, I, I, I mentioned that to me, you represent independent cinema. You've never compromised. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? The fact that in this day and age where there's all these mega corporations making film, you, you've never compromised. Well, I'm, I mean, um, fortunate the time that I entered the movie business and I sort of built up a head of steam over the years. I mean, I've been in earning a living in the film business for more than 55 years. And, um, yeah, more than 55 years, 17, I went to film laboratory, started earning my salary. And then I've been on this wonderful journey and I've been privileged that most of it, well, all of it, pretty much, I've been dictated by my own choices and taste. Mm -hmm. And that's a privilege, really, which I think um, is a fading ideology, but I'm maintaining that. And a lot of um, my colleagues, and a lot of colleagues who still have this um, idea um, of um, cinema adoration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I look, you know, we've all seen the film, and you've repeatedly worked with Cronenberg, you've worked with Nicholas Roque, you work with, uh, 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 you know, Bertolucci, do, do you seek a particular script or do you seek a director to work with? Well, sometimes I'm sought out, and I'm, I'm looked for by somebody who thinks they would shared her, I could share their idea. And um, with, for example, The Last Emperor, I'd just made Merry Christmas to Lawrence, again, chosen by Oshima proposed me and Bernardo proposed me the last emperor in two volumes of books I suggested a Chinese restaurant actually to meet him for the first time and um, he proposed me the Chinese meal mm. of um, that other times I'll buy a book or I'll share somebody's idea I'd like to share a master's idea and then bring it into reality, which I've done in um, multiple times. Like on, um, for example, The Shout, which was my first um, film which won a prize at Cannes, my second feature. Um, I had a screenplay by Robert Graves, The Shout, and I managed to attract uh, Skolomowski, who I know has been here recently yeah. with, with, yeah. the, with the O. And um, <coughs> in fact, I sought him out and from Warsaw, because he, he wrote Knife in the Water. and yeah. With Polanski. With Polanski, and he directed a film called Deep End. Well, he directed many films, which I knew. And I sort of mated that idea of that. It's a great screenplay by, and by Michael Austin, based on Robert Grace's short story, with this very avant-garde filmmaker, known to be avant-garde, and there was a cricket match in it, and I sort of thought, well, I don't want... I don't want an English director to direct my film about which you can, it's surrounding a cricket match because it's going to be incredibly boring and I'll get it polished, you know. Yeah. We had a joke on that. The guy, she rewrote the script a bit and we it's a, normally we call it the first draft for the second draft and the, and the polish. Mm -hmm. It's spelled the same as Polish, you know. So, <laughs> so we, we riffed on that a lot. Which version of the script? Either Polish, you know, which looks which, like that. The film, which uh, makes me think the fact that you've worked with so many directors in different languages, including you know EO this past year that was nominated for the Oscar for best international feature. The fact that you are able to work with filmmakers in different languages is that something that you strive for, that you look forward to? Other, film, other producers will be scared of the idea of producing in a different language. Well, I can go to Mali and work with <coughs> Sulu and Sisi 
and speak my bad French to him and exist and produce a film by myself or go there by myself and feel thrilled at the privilege of that and the next time I can make, be making a $20 million movie and um, I've managed to span the world as a filmmaker um, and it was my privilege to go to Bhutan with the Kenzi Rinpoche yeah. to make the cup and travel to the magicians and borrow the blessing to go to the top of the world, to go to the Arctic Circle, to go to Guatemala, to go to all these places with film crews, um, which are not even possible to do today. Things like traveling across the Sahara with 200 people, right across the journey of Paul Bowles and the sheltering sky. And these were adventures that were, making films was sort of an adventure real adventure and you were dangerous you know you were going where you couldn't be helped mm -hmm. you couldn't communicate even and uh, on films as recent as bad timing um, we were in Morocco and there was no communication with the outside world at all except for telex to get things you couldn't phone you couldn't there was no fax and it'd been invented yeah. <coughs> and so that's um, the era that I spanned, I've spanned this era from um, into where I was at USC yesterday and the students are learning volume stage. And um, it's extraordinary how the, the film business has mutated. Yeah. Um, tell us about Mark Cousins coming to you and saying, we're going to make a film about you. When I introduced the film, I said that we've rarely seen a documentary about a producer. And we have this cliche uh, view of a producer chomping a cigar. And, and this, that's not what we see in this film. Well, I've met chomping cigar producers. And, that, <laughs> and in fact, I met when I was working as an assistant editor on my first film that I got a job on, starring Ava Gardner, called Tamlin. I'm sure nobody's heard of this film. But it was directed by Roddy McDowell, and it was produced by Alan Lab Jr. and Jay Cantor, and was written by Stanley Mann. Anyway, there was a producer in it, he should be nameless. He used to wear a black velvet hunting suit. This was, you know, this was the 60s. <laughs> and uh, he smoked cigars in this screening room. And by the end of the screening room, he was covered in ash. And he was known as the human ashtray. <laughs> and so the human ashtray was there, and he was a producer, and uh, he was quite loud. And so I've seen that, and I hated him because he was paying, he would receive my overtime and all that sort of thing. So I've seen that side of it, and I've seen um, films where it's easy, cheap shot, you know. <laughs> but. There's no films made, no, well, let's say no independent films are made without a producer. And that takes all sorts to make the world. And I'm that sort of producer. And then there's other sorts of producers with other ideas and other dreams. And uh, my dream was to try and make memorable, <coughs> profound, and entertaining films. Um, and then I'd had this idea that the more irritable irritating I could make my films, the more people would write about them, talk about them. You, you, you say entertaining, but when I think about all of you, I think I mentioned when we, uh, when we were having a cocktail that your films are always thought provoking, you know, with, you know crash, uh, we, we, it, but entertaining is, in your view, entertainment has to be part of the equation when you, <clears throat> I expose some things in the film, which is my, um, I like film stars in my films because I can sometimes get them into my films for um, like a gift, you know, from Jack Nicholson to having, getting Michael Fassbender and Kira and Vigo in a film. They're coming to the film because they want to be in the film, you know. And it's not a, it's not a um, financial exercise. They, they, they tell their manager or agent, I want to be with Cronenberg for seven weeks. You know? And I managed to 
I have great difficulty getting through to agents because they know I'm going to propose some material mm -hmm. that is irresistible to their client, and they don't want their, they want their client in Yellowstone or something. You know, they won't want they don't want their client in um, with a scholar Moscow movie with a donkey. You know, but they so that I I use those sort of tactics to get my films. Um, more into the mainstream than there would be normally. Mm -hmm. um, so Mark Cousins approaches you about making a film about you. Was there, was there any hesitation on your behalf about being followed with a camera on a road trip to well, Cannes? I've been asked <clears throat> to make documentary about films before, but more academic, and I didn't really want to do that, and I didn't feel that. So when <coughs> Mark, whose film, The Story of Film. Which is amazing film. And if you see this film, uh, you should seek this out, this 12 hour film. Well, it, you don't have to see it all at once. 12 hours, which explains about it. It explains everything about it from a certain uh, perspective of joining the dots together of world cinema. What was happening um, from the beginning of cinema until sort of Star Wars, um, that, and it's, it's fascinating. I had a respect of this man. I knew him because he was a fan when he was a director of the Edinburgh Film Festival of a lot of my early films. And then I, I, I met him and I liked him. He's very engaging and um, cut 20 years or 30 years later, um, I get approached to by his producer called David Kelly and um, and Mark would like to join you on your annual road trip to make a documentary about about um, cinema and what you, what's going on. Mm -hmm. I do this road trip every year to Cannes. I've done it for 45, maybe 50 times, 45 times. Normal with a colleague who can. Um, used to be able to read a map that was important and read the Guide Vert, which is the cultural book of France with one to three stars, and read the Guide Rouge, which is about eating and staying. So a combination of these two and a map, we managed to do, I've done many of the three star Actually, I like two star, one star sort of places to stay. But on the things of France, I like going to three stars. I like the table that Proust wrote, memory of those things passed. Yeah. So you can go and you can sit in the table. You don't even book it. Nobody's in this place, in this village. So people taking me on these voyages who are cultivated in another way to me. I, was with somebody wonderful called Hercules Belleville, maybe anybody, I don't know when you and then with a professor, English professor called Colin McCabe. And they were um, companions, and this became quite well known, this journey, and Mark Cousin said, let me come with you, and I thought, why not, you know? I don't have to do anything. I mean, I didn't, I saw the film completely like you when he did it, finished it, and he spent seven days with me. Mm. And we drove in the car, and I did what I normally do, and then we were at Cannes, and I checked into the hotel. I, the only scene I think he'd set up, but he told me he didn't, was when I arrived at the hotel. And I think somehow he'd arranged that the, the woman was there to bring me to my room, because I felt a bit set up. But the rest of the film, uh, he claims not, but the rest of the film was all cinema verite, uh, with the talking, uh, in the bar at night with a nice glass of wine. I, I, That's I've, all it was. I've always loved road movies and I love taking road trips because you're not looking at each other face to face. You're in a car looking forward and you do tend to open up when you're in that situation. In the film, we watch you, you know, be so introspective uh, and now self conscious. You don't look at the camera. Um, was that something that after the first couple of hours of traveling with Mark, you for you forgot the camera? Do you just? I was. 
I'm, I wasn't self-conscious at all, and I, I'm, I don't have much vanity, luckily. And um, I didn't really care. But, but he, I didn't, wasn't aware that he was there with the camera, because he has a very discreet person, and, and he has very small cameras. He had three different cameras, and he Samsung, the latest Samsung phone at the time. So you can go and film with places people don't think you're filming, and he's got other cameras, and he charged them at night. And then at the sound, he recorded on the journey, and um, but at night we'd talk in the bar, and um, yeah, it was it was so enjoyable. Yeah. And is there a, a significance to you in the stops that you do on your way to Cannes, like the Drancy? concentration camp and the Lumiere Institute. Is that something that you do every year? Mm, no, I mean, the, the um, Lyon is a nice place to stop, let's face it, you know, it's a pretty nice place, birthplace of cinema as well. To not in, but even to take away the romantics, got pretty good food in Lyon. And um, it's a beautiful place. And then you can turn off at Lyon into the most beautiful part of France left or right off the map, and you go through these wonderful places, like the place we stopped by the lake in the Valley of Verdun. It's heaven on earth. I mean, it's really um, um, perfect. It's just perfect, at the landscape and the, the um, antiquity of the place. And I, I really enjoy that, and he enjoyed it. And you can see it on the camera how, how wonderful it is. And um, some of it, of course, we get a bit highfalutin on the Kiristami side and all that. Mm -hmm. I thought, general, you know, there's a lot of cinema references in there, which are his references and my references. You know, they were, they're um, it's an unusual sort of film because he's integrated in the film as Mark Cousins with me. It's a sort of he made a, it was I think it was clever what he did and the chapters and. No, it's he had it all marked out on um, long scotch tape together, handwritten, you know, the screenplay already. He'd written, he'd made the film. Not what we did exactly, but he had a rough idea, including to challenge me with Drawn C. Mm. And um, he knew I liked, well, he knew I liked Cabuzier, and we'd been talking about Marseille. And uh, I was talking before, before about having been there on high rise, looking at that stuff of Corbusier. And then we went, he took me to this place where there was this incredible church. And things like that were um, um, his ideas, mm -hmm. but on the way. And then we'd stop. I, I was a little bit more prepared, and I. I think one of the hotels we'd booked ahead in the area where we'd be very busy. And in Lyon, we stayed at the place I always stay. And, mm -hmm. and um, it was a, it, it's very, it was very um, ad hoc in the journey, but just going south all the time, you know. Yeah, there are moments, I'm curious to, there are moments in the film that we hear you in voiceover, where you become reflective, are those those moments that were recorded in the car and he uses? No, or? no, he said that he did, he rec the stuff that's in the car. I think that if there's any sync sound in the film, um, voice to camera. I, I'm not. I don't know if I, I'm speaking to a camera. And these were um, things were recorded on a terrace of a hotel somewhere or in a relaxed state every day at the end of the day. He had made notes of what we talked about to expand on some idea. I didn't know what he was doing at the time, but he was expanding on things. And I was trying to give as little of the way as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the other things that I love about this film is listening to you talk about your taste and then for us to see on screen your taste um, you know, come to life. I, I loved, is, was that something that you've always been, you wanted to do with your life, to, to... Yeah, I mean, some people are entertainers, and my father and my uncle were film directors who made entertainment, pretty much sheer entertainment and hits. 
And um, I got politicized by Ken Loach. And um, I got infused, infused by somebody at the National Film Theatre who showed me all these incredible films when I was young, 16, 17. And um, then <clears throat> at the beginning, of when I started, I had no idea what I was doing. Because at the beginning, you don't understand what you're really doing. And then this, after a couple of movies, I sort of understood what I was doing. And I decided, well, I understood that to remain and to do with passion, you've got to um, involve your taste. And I talk about that a lot, actually, to people, because it's the only area, one of the only areas which we don't... Pre it's a, I use my own taste when I go to a restaurant to choose my... I want soup, and I want... Um, in fact, I'll have two appetizers till I think you don't fancy anything. And I use my taste for dinner, and also my clothes, you know, the colour of my, my gabardine here. Choice. Um, but in um, when you use your personal taste in most areas, but when you come to making your work, oh no, I'm just going to use other persons. What's your most popular dish? I'll have it, and not what I feel like. So I, I decided okay, I'm going to dictate my work by my taste, and uh, I didn't know that until I decided to do it. And I sort of at a certain period I did it that. Um, I was ref not reflecting on other things, but do I like it? Mm -hmm. And can I be passionate about it? And can I be good? Can it be great? And then I think the last thing I think about is the audience. <laughs> and it sounds crazy, but it has kept me in, in, in trade. Because there are enough people out there who I want um, to be given an alternative uh, of taste and um, maybe want to be confronted a bit in a darkened room or in another way. And they give me the, the space to make the films and mm -hmm. to make them principally in a sort of some sort of commerce mm -hmm. and understanding the size of films that I can make versus the audience I can find for them. And generally trying to understand um, how it all worked at the beginning and now um, I understand it completely, and it's all changing. This is the moment I got to understand it all. It's changed, you know. Yeah. And the other incredible aspect about your career is how prolific you have been. Over 67 films you produced, and, and there's no slowing you down. No, more than 70, I hate to say, but um, I think it's been rising 73. I want to make 100 movies. I don't know if I can get there. So but that's the goal, is to keep no, going joking, until you... I'm joking. I mean, um, De Laurentiis made uh, 220 films. And, um, but the individual producer, it's be hard to make that many films today because each... I had a group of people who trusted me and I could make phone calls on the dial of circular phone and get through to somebody in Rome and get somebody, somebody in Paris and uh, even get through to somebody in New York. Give me a couple of million bucks, I'm doing this. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, deal, deal. And then did the paperwork later. It's yeah. another, it was another uh, time, existence, and um, it's silly to be romantic. It's being historical to talk about it without rancor how it's changed, you know, mm -hmm. it's just because I, I'm going to continue. So I've got to sort of try and absorb and fit in and smuggle, literally smuggling. You smuggle your ideas now. Mm -hmm. Like you have come like Kiristami in Iran. Yeah. And, and at a time, how many projects do you have you know, in the back burner, waiting for it to get done? Well, lots, because um, some films I last for 20 years before I make them. I keep optioning the book, and um, I, like the Contiki, I don't know, the Contiki, I loved Tor Heidel when I was a boy, I loved his book, The Contiki Expedition, and then I got to meet him, 
and I had the Master and Picard in my hand, and he'd refused to sell the book to anybody, because, of, but I managed to get that, and then I couldn't get it, I couldn't find support for that film, uh, 20 years, and then I finally found a way of doing it, and um, that was again nominated for a film, not best foreign film, but I was trying to make it as a, <clears throat> I was trying to make it as a, I was obviously going wrong on it, and High Rise Ballard, and it took me years to get that, and Naked Lunch, seven, eight years, Naked Lunch, and um, I can stick with something and uh, keep it in my store cupboard. I've got a few, uh, quite a few um, that I'm developing. I'm, I'm developing a film about Billy Wilder. Oh, wow. And uh, based on a Jonathan Coe book um, called Billy Wilder and Me, about a young girl who discovers the greatness of Billy Wilder and Izzy Diamond. Um, so that's what I'm hoping to do next with Stephen Frears. I'm trying to find the money to do that now. And, 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 and Jeremy, last question. You always, be, being a maverick in independent cinema, you won the Oscar for The Last Emperor. You could have done any commercial studio film after that. You stuck to your guns with independent cinema. Why? Um, I'm sick. You know, no. I mean, how many, f how many meals can you have? I, I, I got something quite valuable because um, I got some sort of recognition in my lifetime. I, who thinks that's going to happen to you as a producer? We are absolutely, as you said, figures of fun, um, hardly identified with our work, um, and. Um, I'm, I got rewarded like that, and um, I don't care about the cash. Yeah, I like what it's given me, the success sometimes, but I, it's not my motivation to make the films. Um, I sometimes, I don't take money on films sometimes at all. I give money to the film, and then another one, I'll just make some money from it. You know, they're all, it's, um, my work is my holiday, my bank balance is my company balance. You know, it's like all together, everything's together in the way that I'm, I've conducted my life. You know, it's all linked together, my ups and downs. Uh, but it's all pushing forward to make films um, in the old way. Uh, and without a boss, you know, you're the boss with your pounds. You know, there's no writer's room on a film. Um, like we do, you know, you know, you all collaborate, but it's everything, the terminology and the, the way has changed in the many respects for those of you who are here in the movie business, you know how much it's changed, the methodology of it, but still you're telling a story with a camera and recording people's emotions and things. Well, bless you, and, and you're so inspiring, and Thanks for inviting what me. an honor to have you here I, I don't tonight. Know, I've got a friend here called Derek, and I mean, are they here? He's here, Derek Power, right there. Yeah. Yeah. We grew up in the same village in England, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, everybody, for being here.